Greetings, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to uh, part two of this uh, um, amazing series that we're doing right now, myself and Dr. Jay Smith, who has been here with me in studio for um, quite a while now. Uh, we've been doing uh, multi-parts from different topics related to the Quran and its history and its problems, and now we're uh, focusing on Islam, its history, and the problem or historical criticism, if you wish, of Islam itself. Uh, part one, we gave a quick overview uh, concerning the traditional view uh, that Muslims basically will tend to give you about uh, the birth of Muhammad, the dates related to that, uh, his life in Mecca, his life in Medina, and so on and so forth. And we try to contrast that with uh, biblical uh, datings and to show you which one is more reliable when it comes to the existence of eyewitness accounts and other factors as well. Today we're going to continue with that uh, criticism, and uh, we will ask Dr. J now to present to us uh, what are some of the, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, discoveries out there by the scholars in the field. Let's do that. Thanks so much for having me on board, and thanks so much for giving me a, a, both, both of us a platform now to actually to ask the historical question. And that's what we want to do. We want to see not what the narratives say from each uh, viewpoint. We want to know what history is actually telling us. Right. And the historians are very suspicious that everything they know know about Muhammad and, of course, Islam is two to three hundred years after the fact. Now let's put up the screen and let's look and see what their concern is. And this is from these are Western historians who are Islamists. They are all experts in Islam. This is their concern. Dr. Humphrey says, Islam as we know it did not exist in the seventh century, but evolved over a period of two to three hundred years. He right. said this way back in 1991, so this is older material. This is not new. What we're introducing right now is not the newest material. So Muslims should not be shocked by what we're going to be saying in the episodes yet to come. Uh, Dr. Andrew Rippon, uh, who has just died actually last year, he said this, the Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. Uh, we do know that Wandsborough also supports this. He said this in 1977. Rippon said this in 1985. Toby Lester, who wrote that famous article, uh, was referring to this in 1999. The conclusion is that the history of Islam, at least from the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik, hold that name in your, under your cap. This is an important name. Abdul Malik, who ruled from 685 to 705 and before, is a later fabrication. Dr. Patricia Crook, uh, Crone, uh, Dr. Michael Cook, uh, Robinson, these are all the ones who are making and coming to how do they come to this conclusion? And that's what we want to do today. We right. want to know and see how they came to the conclusion. Well, let's take a look at the next slide. If so much of the Islamic history, and this is their concern, was created so late, like we said in the first episode, why did it take so long to write it all down? Why did it take two to 300 years to write this down? If this is the greatest prophet in the history of mankind, if this is the seal of all the prophets, they should have written down right away. Absolutely, absolutely. And Muslims, whenever I've asked this, they said, well, they were not literate. Now, hold on, stop a minute. They controlled Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo by 652. All those five great cities of the Levant were under their jurisdiction. By the time Abdul Malik comes to power in 685, they controlled all the way from Spain in the west to India in the east. That whole land, swath of land, was under their control. I'm Are sure you telling me nobody could read and write absolutely. between India and Spain? They had a lot of educated people in there. Absolutely. And remember, we had, there was a library uh, in Alexandria that was destroyed in the 5th century. This is 200 years before what we're talking about. What do you have in libraries if they're not books? So certainly they could read and write. They were not illiterate. This was, what, weren't we just talking about the, the compilation of the Quran? Uh, at the time of Abu Bakr, the first compilation by Abu Bakr, Zaid bin Thabit does that in 632 to 634. Didn't we also talk about a second compilation by Uthman? Absolutely. This is the mid-7th century. Even the tradition tells us that the Quran was written down. So uh, certainly someone had to know how to read and write if they wrote it absolutely. down. Absolutely. And they, uh, Muhammad himself, according to, to the tradition, had people around him in his immediate circle, close circle, that used to write for him. Absolutely. Ubay ibn Kaab, ibn Masud, ibn Musa, Zaid, Zaid ibn Thabit. Who are these right. guys? They were all write, writing uh, codices. So this idea of illiteracy may be work for Muhammad and just for him, but certainly not for his companions and certainly not for the Quran. Now, so where did the ninth century, where did al-Buhari, where did Sahih Muslim, where did Ibn Daud, where did Tirmidhi, where did they get their material from? 
Correct. If they didn't know the man, if they weren't there, hadn't seen him, two or three hundred years, if they didn't know that, then our question, and this is a good question, historical question, can we therefore trust it if it's two to three hundred years later? Yep. And should we therefore go back to the seventh century? Shouldn't we go back to what actually happened? So let's do that and let's see what they're finding. Let's Ooh, do it. Now this is, gets fun because it's when we go back to that century uh, that we're going to see Loft. Now let's just look at this map here. I will put it up on the uh, slide there. You can see it. Look at the brown area. That's the area that they controlled by 661. So we're talking roughly 30 years after Muhammad's death. All that brown area, that includes Persia and Arabia. They're starting to move across Libya, over across uh, northern Africa, uh, and they're going to eventually get all the way up to Andalusia. And over the other direction uh, to the east, they're going to eventually get all the way to the Mongol Empire in India. So right. that's the swath of land that they control uh, within 30 to 40 to 60 years, because we're looking at the first 60 years after Muhammad's death, up to the time of Abdul Malik, who is the great caliph, the great reformer. He's going to be coming into quite a bit, and that's why I keep on remembering, uh, mentioning his name as we move into this material. But just so you get the map, so you see what we're looking at. Now, let's look at this slide, because these are the major scholars who are who were, I'll be using and I have been using. Dr. John Wansborough, he was head of department at School of Oriental African Studies there in the University of London in London. He wrote two books called Quranic Studies and Sectarian Milieu in 1977 and 1978. That blew open this whole thing of historical criticism uh, because he was basically saying in those two books, everything we see in the Quran does not make sense for the seventh century. This is material that was what they wouldn't have had access to until the 8th century because they, these were being written in places like Stesiphon, which was the archaic name for Baghdad. It doesn't make sense this early. Liter from a literary standpoint, I don't understand how you can have this kind of material that early because it's all been borrowed. He was very clear. It has been borrowed. And we know who they borrowed from because this material that they borrowed from, like we said in our earlier episodes, were written down in the second century, in the fifth century, but they were not in the Hijaz, in that part of the world that Correct. Muhammad was living, if he did live down there. Haunting, who is my professor when I was at School of Art, Oriental African Studies in 19, I was there in 1994, uh, 1995, and I studied under him. Uh, he has been the one that just opened up for me. Uh, I had never heard this material until I studied under him about all the problems of the first century of Islam. Dr. Patricia Krone, this woman from Denmark who studied under Dr. Wansborough and got her the doctorate there at SOAS, then went and was head of department at Oxford University when she wrote Mech and Trade in the Rise of Islam. We're going to talk about her when we get to Mecca. She reads and writes 15 languages. I know, in different languages, absolutely. And These are archaic languages. These are not modern languages. These are archaic languages. I don't know anyone that has that kind of caliber. She's a linguist. So she go, went back and she did what all historians should do. She went back to the original documents. That's why she is so uh, threatening to a lot of Muslims. They absolutely hate her guts. Now, she has just died last year. That's right. But I got to know her when she then wrote this book. She was then got death threats and then moved to Cambridge University. And she helped me put my, in fact, she was the one that helped me put my debate together in 1995 when I debated Dr. Jamal Badawi on this material. That was in 1995, August of 1995. I did my first debate with Dr. Jamal Badawi, considered to be the world authority on the Quran in the English-speaking world at that time. He came through the uh, uh, Trinity, uh, Trinity uh, School at Cambridge, and we did this debate at two hours debate, and I gave him 10 historical challenges. 1995, we're talking about. We're now in 2018. And they so remain see, probably standing. Those 10 uh, questions he could not answer. They are still up there on the internet today, and we're going to unpack some of them, but we've moved way beyond since 1995. It's much easier today, as you're going to find out as we go through this episode. Uh, Dr. Rippen uh, from Oxford University at that time. He's now moved. He's no longer there. But when I knew him, he was at Oxford University. He reads and writes 18 languages. So these are linguists. These are the ones. That's why they're so dangerous because they're going back to the original documents. Dr. Uh, did I say Rippon? I'm sorry, that wasn't Rippon. That was Hoyland. It was uh, from Oxford. Dr. Andrew Rippon is from Calgary, and he was the one that probably has taken this very difficult academic material and brought it to layman's terminology. That's, That's correct. why and I recommend on him. the Quran a lot. There you go. And he focuses on Islam and how Islam began, and uh, he's got some great material on their beliefs and practices. Correct. Now, Hoyland is one I meant to talk about. Is from Oxford. He reads and writes 18 languages. And he has a wonderful book, by the way, Seeing Islam as Others, others See It. it. And yeah. probably the best book that actually shows 
that the uh, the people that were living at that time did not know about this religion. They were did just not, quotations, but not specific names or anything like that. There was no reference to a, a people called Muslims, no reference to a religion called Islam, no reference to a book called the Quran, and no reference to a man named Muhammad, except from external sources. We'll get to that later. Dr. Yehudo Nevo, out of University of Jerusalem, did the best work in looking on the earliest inscriptions, showing us that the, the documentary book just doesn't fit this historical narrative coming out of Islam. And then from the German school, you have Dr. Gunther Luning, you have Dr. Gerd Puin, you have Dr. von Bothmer, and you have Dr. Oleg. These are the ones that we used a bit in our last episodes who then unpacked the Quran and looked at the earliest manuscripts. Could you give our audience just the, the, the one minute maybe explanation, what do we mean by the revisionist? Okay, revising is what it means. A revisionist is someone who looks at a narrative and says, well, there are some problems here. Uh, and they, they said, we need to see what history is telling us. We need to revise it back to the historical record. In other words, in this case, revising some of the traditional Islamic dates. Huge revisionism, and that's why revisionist is a dirty word for Muslims. Muslims hate the name revisionist. The, another name they give is orientalist. They are part, the Orient is now today, you would think of, e, uh, of China. Back in the 1800s and 1900s, the Orient always meant the Middle East. So orientalism is a study of, really, a study of Islam. Unfortunately, that is, it doesn't make sense in the 21st century because Orient, but that's the traditional name for the academic name for someone who is an expert on the Middle East, the Correct. Orientalist. Correct. And they hate the name Orientalist because that's a Western scholar who is studying Islam. So these are all Orientalists. That's and correct. these are all, these names that we have up on that slide there are all from the revisionist school. Thank you. Now, there are three books that have been popularized, and this is probably, rather than going to their material, I mean, Dr. Patricia Corona, she doesn't translate anything. She keeps it in its original tongue. You and I don't know these languages, so you need someone to unpack that for you. Correct. And the person who does that is this man here, Dr. Tom Holland. Uh, he is not an Orientalist. He is not an historian. He is a literary uh, critic. In fact, his area of expertise is literature. He's a great writer. He actually explains it. He took six years to write that book there, uh, the UK version, the uh, US version, In the Shadow of the Sword. Taking all this material that we're going to introduce, not all of it, but back in 2012, he was able to take it down and put it into one book. If you're going to get a book, read that book first, because that will set the stage of what we're going to be saying. Then he did a documentary called Islam, the Untold Story. Now, this documentary was uh, was uh, shown on uh, Channel 4 television in Britain on Ag August 4th, uh, in, I'm sorry. In, in August 28th? So August 28th in 2012. They only showed it one time. It's only 90 minutes long. I have it on my computer here. You can't, see, I, I've been told you, that some people have been able to find it outside of the UK, but they do not want it to be, uh, 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 they do not want it to be broadcast outside the UK. When they wanted to broadcast it a second time in November of that same year, there was such an outcry from the Muslim community that they didn't show it a second time. Hmm. Uh, you need to watch this document. It's only 90 minutes long. And it takes what he says in his books and puts it in a visual format. But he's very careful not to come to conclusions. He just said, isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? He has a Muslim scholar with him from, uh, I think, from Georgetown University who just says, yes, that is it, but um, I don't care. It's not important because we have 1.8 billion Muslims that they, they, they disagree. It's basically his only recourse. The traditional argument that the traditional numbers argument. matter. We got more people, That's therefore right. deal with it. So it's a fascinating documentary. It would be great if you could see it, those of you who are watching it. But I want to go down to this man here, Dan Gibson. Dan Gibson, I've never met him, but I've emailed him. And he does, he did what every researcher should do. He went and he lived in situ. He lived where he did his research. He lived to where the questions were. He lived in Jordan. He lived in, uh, he lived in uh, Yemen. He lived amongst the Bedouin. And from 1979 to 2005, 2004, excuse me, 1979 to 2004, for 25 years, he went and looked at what the Quran was saying. And then he tried to find the places that are in the Quran, the geographical places. And that makes sense. I mean, if the Quran is talking about something, let's go and verify it. And then he went and he looked at the mosques. <laughs> And if you look at the slide again, that book there, those are the three things he has written. The Quranic Geography, which came out in 2011. The Sacred City is a documentary which you can get online. Absolutely. That came out in 2016. And then just last year, in 2017, he came out with Early Islamic Giblets. 
And I have all of those, and you have uh, probably all of them, and they're wonderful resources for people to go Please them. get them. If you don't have them, you need to do them. But what we're going to do is we're going to actually end with this one slide. I want you to look at this slide here, because I'm going to tell you what they all said before we even start to prove it. And I want my audience, especially the Muslims, to pay close attention to this. This is what they found. Now, we're going to have to prove all this, but let's start with what they found. Number one, the first Arab inscription referencing Muhammad is not till 691. Ooh, two, 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 two. In other words, there's nothing so far to prove that that name was mentioned prior to this. From, Mus from Arab sources. Now, I'm using the word Arab cautiously That's for a reason. That's important, yeah. Why? Because we don't have any reference to Muslims until the 690s. The word we Muslims. The word Muslims. So what did these people, these Arabs, call themselves? Well, they called themselves Sarasin, which is the name for the Arabs of that pair that's area. Right, that's right. They called themselves Hagarins because they were From in the Hadja. line of Hagar. Hagar. They called themselves Ishmaelites because the line of Ishmael through Hagar. Uh, they called themselves Maghreb because they're from the Maghreb, which is the area they lived in. And they use the word Mahajrun, which means people of the Exodus. Who oh, exactly? Who moved? Which people who are moving, like nomadic people. Exactly. Those are the names they gave themselves. Hold on a minute. This is going up to 690. Muhammad died in 632. So for 60 years, they never use their, the name they should have. They use these other names for themselves. That's correct. Where is this reference to Muslim? It's only then? common sense. You would have thought that these are the first Muslims. Why didn't they use it in any documentation we can find today? Let's look at the third category. The first reference to the name Islam is not till 691 introduced on the Dome of the Rock. That's why the Dome of the Rock is so important. We're going to come back to it again because other things were introduced there as we're going to find later on. Now the first, re and here is the one, the hardest one for Muslims to stomach. The first reference to Mecca is not till 741. Ooh, and that's on any ancient maps. Anywhere. This is not even on a map. This is on a document uh, called uh, Apocalypse of Pseudo Methodius. We're going to talk about it later on when we get to Mecca. But the first reference to Mecca is not till the 8th century. Now, you'll see why that's hugely significant. And then, of course, the first biography, as we talked about earlier, of Muhammad is not introduced until 833. Take a look at those, for those six references and see why this is so damaging to Islam. Absolutely. And uh, I can't find a better place to stop this exciting, basically, uh, new discoveries that uh, at least you, uh, what I appreciate about you is you, you share what's out there. This isn't your opinion. This isn't uh, not even your research. No. Uh, you are recording and reporting to people, just the people, in, uh, you know, the man on the street. Go, take a look at this source, see what's going on in there, and ask yourself these vital questions. Remember, we have 1.6 billion Muslims who are basing their faith on traditional dates. Absolutely. Yep. And we want them to question that. Thank you so much. And uh, until we meet again uh, for part three to discuss the, or continue discussions. We're going to go into the geographical problems. Wait till exactly. you see what we have found. You know. Come back and see what now is being exposed concerning the real problems of geography in the Quran. Absolutely. We will continue these historical criticism and we'll take the geographical angle next time. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash Sierra International.